Thank you very much. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. I'm sorry I missed the, the first uh, meeting of this uh, network. Um, uh, believe me, there would be no place I would rather be than here. And I'm having a great time already. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit to this title, Musician, Musicians Inside Algorithms, Live Coding, Performance Ecologies and Messed Materialities, with specific reference to a series of works that I've been developing with Tom Schofield in Culture Lab and Fine Art at Newcastle, a series of works called Turing Tape Music. Uh, but I'm going to set this in context with some of my other preoccupations. Uh, uh, um, uh, people with a historical eye amongst you will notice that my title is a little bit of a play on composers inside electronics, uh, the group of uh, performers, composers, uh, builders, uh, roughly configured around John Driscoll and still ongoing. Um, and, uh, and I kind of wanted to transpose a little bit of that kind of thinking into the relationship that musicians could have with algorithms, and that's a little bit of what I'm doing. But I, I will come out at the end, I think, with a slightly displaced uh, view of uh, what the coupling term should be between musicians and algorithms. Um, uh, to introduce some of the, the preoccupations I have, I'm just going to very quickly do uh, uh, a review of some of the things I've made over the years. Um, I have a minor degree of notoriety uh, for uh, developing something which I call a Victorian synthesizer, which, believe you me, is only a loudspeaker and a battery, and it's seeing how far you can get with completely minimal materials and, uh, and confining oneself to uh, methods of sound, electronic sound production, which were known to the Victorians, so you cannot connect uh, uh, an amplifier output to its input at near unity gain, because that was patented by von Barkhausen in 1913, post-Victorian. But you can hack loudspeakers, moving core loudspeakers, patented by Oliver Lodge and uh, Siemens in Germany, and Siemens in Germany in 1860s, so that's all fine. Oh My God is another kind of series of explorations <laughs> I've been doing, where uh, random circuitry um, job lots, Eastern European decommissioned nuclear power station job lots from, bought from maplins of components are placed into a mixing bowl, uh, <coughs> powered uh, with some power source and then dipped in and then convert, connected direct to a jack plug and an amplifier. No messing. Um, and uh, again, uh, a kind of absolutely raw uh, communion with electronic materials and opening out things to a kind of gestural intervention of a, of a fundamentalist sort. The Earth Synthesizer. Um, uh, yeah, it's a bucket of earth, all right. Um, and uh, by varying its uh, uh, dampness, uh, the presence or absence of living worms, uh, children's hands, etc., uh, etc., et uh, two electrodes of dissimilar metals uh, connected direct to, uh, well, cascading preamps, and, uh, and you get sounds very much like that, in fact. In fact, most of my music sounds very much like this. <laughs> yeah, it's got different ways of going splutter, splutter, splutter. Um, uh, well, OK, so let's now take some of this sort of fundamentalism of interaction and um, kind of uh, uh, joyful nothingness uh, into uh, a slightly more algorithmic realm, or at least a realm that might, some might recognize as algorithmic. This is uh, one of the things that I made as part of a... Um, a concerted work in that uh, myself and colleagues at uh, Leicester de Montfort had a year and a bit ago. Um, uh, one knob to rule them all was the uh, f uh, fr title we used to configure our uh, enterprises, uh, the idea of making very minimal interaction devices to do maximal stuff, or maybe minimal stuff, to minimal devices to do minimal stuff. Um, and uh, 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 I did a, a number of pieces building on a technique of Jim Freezer's to uh, uh, attach touch sensitivity to a humble potentiometer um, and uh, uh, made a, um, uh, a work which uh, reads the um, uh, uh, data coming from the potentiometer and the touch data uh, via uh, an Arduino Nano Direct into <coughs> wavetables, yes, direct into wavetables. The data goes direct into wavetables and is then scanned at various rates with cascades of amplitude modulation, uh, um, which uh, will, with uh, a, a few knob twists, uh, take you into the next year or so. 
um, as the periods multiply out. Uh, again, the principle here is a, a kind of fractal expansion of the data that is in uh, the wave tables, the data just given from sensor data direct. Uh, another piece I made as part of this uh, piece called Ghost Radio. Uh, here the one knob was actually the tuning on a, uh, um, a conventional radio receiver and that uh, signal, a station, a noise, or whatever, uh, was uh, uh, split into uh, eight frequency bands and amplitude followed and normalized within those eight frequency bands and those were converted into control voltages for, the, for my modular synthesizer. So again, by tuning between radio stations, one could uh, control multiple things at the same time uh, across uh, eight, uh, 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 with eight targets going into the modular synthesizer. So the periodicity of music picked up, or the, uh, the quasi-periodicity of speech, or the noise between radio stations could all be accessed within a, a single twitch. Um, a kind of term that I've been playing with over the years and uh, <coughs> uh, is the idea of performance ecologies. And I'll introduce this by kind of some ways by way of contrast. These are two antique photographs from the MIT Media Lab, Joe Paradiso, um, on your left, uh, working with the um, uh, chair which was made for Penn and Teller. Uh, uh, which, which, uh, 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 in which the electromagnetic fields around the um, uh, two antennae are uh, displaced by the uh, inductance of the human body. And on the right, uh, Todd Macover and his, uh, um, uh, one of his uh, hypercello projects. And I, I think it's interesting how uh, these vintage photographs are photographed. There's an ordering between humans and technology in it. There's a display of gesture. There's a kind of frontal addressing of the camera. There's a, 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 a putting present but absent in the background of uh, a digital technology. Uh, there's um, uh, uh, there's a, an abstract gaze in the eye. There's a, a whole manner of different things which I think are very kind of telling here about how humans and technologies are ordered. And in a way, this kind of introduces my notion of, of performance ecology. There's a way of organizing the ecology of performance here, which uh, sees humans and their instrumentation as in, for, as in the forefront, and the digital wherewithals as uh, in the back, uh, in, uh, backgrounded. And um, I, this, this, uh, uh, I, I can contrast this. Uh, this is a desktop of um, the great Pedro Ribello. Uh, who, uh, from a performance at uh, UEA, when UEA had a school of music many years ago, a uh, performance with uh, Francesca, which I ethnographically documented, and this is Pedro's desktop. And this is kind of interestingly organized as you go from left to right, you go from more fixed materials to more malleable. Uh, you have the fixity of a score, the fixity of a CD player. Uh, on the right you have um, <coughs> a saxophone case with a contact microphone in which can be banged as the need requires, opened and closed and thumped. Um, and in the middle you have the things which are in the middle. You have algorithmically mediated transformations of live sound. And uh, you have things which are close by, uh, the mouse, and, uh, uh, and the uh, <coughs> built like a tank classy P PV fader box, which I have one and I dropped on my toe once. And, um, the, um, and, and these are the things which are immediately manipulable. And the things which are maybe less manipulable uh, a little way further away. Uh, here have uh, a few snapshots from my own uh, historic practice and also a picture uh, from uh, when Stern Olof Hellstrom tried to uh, hack around with um, uh, crackle boxes. Um, and uh, the, one, the one in the top left, for example, shows uh, when I did some sort of desktop electric guitar projects. Again, there's a, an organizing of the of what needs to be close at hand, what's further away, and what's uh, actually a pace away, the pint, in case you pour it on the electronics. Uh, so there's an organization of the performance environment here, and, and I have thought over the years about that maybe one should take this kind of organization, this performance ecology, this uh, a, a, a extended arrangement of, of, of device, algorithm, uh, human gesture, as, uh, as the unit of analysis and study uh, and not necessarily the things that go in it. 
Uh, and in fact, maybe some of these sorts of stupid things are perfect for placing along with their mates in an extended sense of a performance ecology. Um, so, populating a performance ecology with desktops of shit, as uh, Simon Emerson often quotes me as one saying, and I, I never remember when I actually said that what I played was a desktop of shit, but Simon often quotes me as saying that. So where, do, where, so where does live coding fit into this? Well, uh, here's Sean Cotterell live coding. And again, you see a very specific performance ecology here. Uh, we see uh, uh, top lap compliant. Uh, uh, Sean uh, projects his code screen. He's engaged with his uh, 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 laptop. Uh, the projection uh, uh, passes over him. A, uh, uh, a phenomenon Alex McLean often re has referred to as code face. Um, it, it makes live code as photographable, right? If you have <laughs> this sort of thing, you know. Um, and uh, it had, did occur to me, well, you know, well, what would somebody like me who does all of those sorts of silly things with buckets of earth and, and knobs and stuff, <coughs> what, what, what would I do if I, if I went live coding? Well, Turing Tape Music, the project with Tom Schofield, is a partial answer to this. Um, uh, as every child knows, um, uh, Alan Turing published in 1936, I think, a, um, an imagining of a computational machine, which he actually called the A machine for automated machine, uh, in which um, uh, a tape passed over uh, uh, a head. The head read uh, symbols from the tape uh, and could erase them or write things in their place. And uh, uh, different things were written uh, corresponding to what state the machine was in. So if the machine was in a particular state, one thing read might lead to a different outcome than if the machine was in a different state. And Turing argued it through that, uh, 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 well, essentially, that such a device was what you needed to compute any computable function. And this is a fundamental result in uh, uh, the theory of computation. And it seems to me, then, if we're going to do something sort of interesting with, it seems to me, if I was going to do something interesting with live coding, I'd live code a Turing machine. So um, Tom Schofield uh, built one, a physicalized Turing machine. I mean, the Turing machine is very typically a, a thought experiment, an abstraction in the history of mathematics but, well, 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 uh, and com computation, but we kind of built one. Um, it has just uh, 32 uh, uh, um, array for uh, an array of 32 cells. It has uh, uh, seven LEDs for MIDI compatibility, and uh, and an eighth LED um, uh, you know, for um, other stuff. Uh, a head uh, literally reads the LEDs with uh, little uh, light-dependent resistors and then passes what it's reading uh, to uh, a program which is actually housed externally, running in PD, uh, which manages the rule set, which are running in processing in the, one of the later versions of it, uh, which then changes the patterns of illumination and moves the head. And uh, we sonify this in various ways, and this is an important point, lots of different kinds of ways, including putting inductive coils on the servo motors <coughs> and just get it by miking up the general clank uh, uh, but treating the uh, array of uh, lights as a, uh, a performable symbolic score, treating it as uh, entries in a low resolution wavetable, etc., etc., etc. Multiple simultaneous methods of sonification. Um, and then, well, how do we program the machine? So, uh, how, do we, how do we derive these kinds of rule sets? Why? Of course, through conductivity changes in a bucket of earth in one version or through conductivity changes in various samples of water in another version. Um, and uh, the pieces presented in a whole extended performance ecology where each states, the states of the machine are, are visualized in various ways for top lap compliance. Show your code screen. Okay, we don't just show the code, we show the execution of the code here. Uh, and uh, uh, without giving any help to the user whatsoever. Um, and uh, so there's, there's the, the, uh, a set of sequences which are sampled from the score. There's uh, two lines of sensor data. There's the tape. There's a representation of the rule sets. And there's a history representation across the bottom in various ways of defining the history of the machine. 
and that's some stuff. Uh, so we performed this at Pixel uh, in Bergen in Norway, a version of this subtitled The Sea is Ground, where we took uh, uh, local samples of seawater, there's a lot in Bergen, and, uh, and used that uh, uh, fluctuations in conductivity in the seawater to, uh, to reprogram the machine. And there's a picture of Tom and me in, 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 in performance. Uh, unfortunately, my documentation of this performance isn't great. Uh, it is on YouTube if you want to kind of hear what it sounds like and if you want to see a bit more of what Tom and I look like in profile. Um, Stooky John Comes to Belfast is what I'm going to uh, um, perform later today. And this is a kind of uh, putting together of some of these concerns for uh, life coding, performance ecology, um, moving across different kinds of materialities uh, into bringing it together with the concerns uh, for listening and also uh, uh, the uh, concern which is in Alison's and Chris's work for feedback uh, uh, and, and other, kinds of, other kinds of thematics that we share. Uh, Stooky John is my name for a ventriloquist's dummy head that I acquired a few years ago off eBay. Uh, he's actually an American Charlie the McCarthy doll. Uh, I kind of beheaded him, and um, uh, and I use him for uh, a binaural listening. His kind of binaural listening, right? His kind of binaural listening. There's nothing between those microphones other than empty air mm, and evil thoughts, and um, uh, you know, and the microphones are not set far apart, you know, this is not binaural listening for humans, this is for him, okay? And this is me sort of setting up um, yesterday a little bit about what the performance might look like. Um, I'm having Stooky John listen to the room sound, and over the years I've done quite a lot with things with mashing room sound, and, uh, uh, and he's doing various forms of, well he's listening very simply for impacts and pitches. Um, I'm not doing anything particularly sophisticated with uh, the machine learning, that could be something for the future, but his, uh, in, his impressions of pictures and of, um, of impacts are used to uh, live code a pair of um, coding uh, environments which are a, a two-dimensional and a one-dimensional um, um, set of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of states um, and this, this is a little bit sort of experimental this part of the work but I'm interested in working on uh, esoteric programming languages, very minimal programming languages for their musical potential in this kind of setting uh, and for top lap compliance uh, how what is going on in Stooky John's mind is presented towards the back uh, and, uh, and this is again used to derive voltages, control voltages for a modular synthesizer uh, as well as uh, affecting the transformation of room sound. Um, um, you know, media historians amongst you will also uh, of course know that I am drawn to um, a ventriloquist's dummy head because of uh, uh, and, um, Stooky Bill, uh, John Logie Baird's uh, ventriloquist dummy which was the first uh, human noid face uh, transmitted televisually and um, uh, and making for a kind of rather fascinating and macabre impression and also I think uh, the figure of the dummy actually is uh, an interesting one to think about as a way of coalescing some thoughts about what relationships uh, between humans and technological non-humans might be like and that's part of what I'm kind of alluding to or messing around in this. So I hope I've kind of shown, discussed a little bit of, uh, of stuff with you, I have to discuss a little bit of stuff with you, um, how I'm kind of involved in, I suppose, what some might call a media archaeology of life coding, trying to think of life coding opportunities uh, uh, in, in that, that the kind of, uh, um, in terms of a locus classicus of computer science, I'm interested in uh, uh, performance environments which are materially heterogeneous. I'm interested in 
what sense can be given to performing data and performing the algorithmic. Uh, live coding is a matter of performing the algorithmic. I'm interested in how these things fit into extended ecologies of performance and through this interrogate questions of the relationship between humans and their others. Thank you very much.